About our church is we are uh, unapologe- unapologetically King James only. We believe that most of the, all of the modern English Bibles have been perverted. Uh, we believe Satan purposefully has omitted entire verses. Uh, so, you know, we're we going to stick with the old tried and true around here. If it ain't broke, it don't need fixing. Amen. King James Bible is what built our, one of the things that built our country and why God blessed our country. Uh, the Mayflower had a copy of the King James Bible on it when it came over here. Uh, legend has that, and history teaches teaches us that that they've got that actual Bible in a museum that they feel like was the one that came over on the Mayflower. God has put a stamp of approval on this King James, and I can't say that about any other perversion, especially not when it's got words missing and entire verses missing. I mean, that's a no-brainer, folks. God said, if you mess with the word. He'll take your part out of the book of life. God doesn't play around when it comes to His Word. He doesn't want anybody messing with it. All right, so that's why we are King James only. Hebrews 10, 25. Let's read uh, verse... Okay, let's start in verse 24. I'll back, back up. It's all, look, man, it's all good. I feel like reading the whole chapter, but let's, let's start in verse 23. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now let me just stop and say this real quick. It's not even in my notes. But a lot of people just have the mindset of, I'm just going to go to church for what I can get. Feed me, pastor. I just want to go to church for what I can get. And they get fat. They get dumb, fat, dumb, and happy. And it's just all about me. Feed me. What can I get out of it? And I am supposed to feed you. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you can just, uh, you know, think about others. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. You know, sometimes it's not about all about what you can get, but what you can give. You know, sometimes it's just about you coming and encouraging someone. Or maybe pastor preaches a more elementary-based sermon that's designed to help some young Christian. Maybe you should take that into consideration. Okay, well, there's a younger Christian that needed this sermon. It's not all about you. Okay, it's, it's, you know, it's not. Don't don't come to the the mindset, well, well, you know, oh, well, he pastor preached a salvation message, or some evangelists came here and preached a salvation message, and I'm, I'm already saved. Well, it's not all about you. Amen. We've got young people in here that need to be challenged. They need to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. They need to be challenged. You know, a good salvation message is okay every now and then, because it ain't all about you. Amen. Okay, it ain't, it ain't all about you. So don't, don't have this mindset that church is just all about you. Sometimes church is just about you encouraging someone else. Coming and challenging someone else and being an encouragement and a blessing to someone else. Let's look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that approaching? I believe it's talking about the rapture. And it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. You know, you'd be hard pressed to find a church in San Antonio that has a, a Baptist church that has a Sunday afternoon or evening service. Many have closed down. You'd probably you'd be hard pressed to find one with a midweek Bible study. The Bible says we were to have more church, not less. Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. God knew that as that day approaches, you know, we start having certain mandates, vaccine mandates, and we start having uh, the government encroach upon us and start taking away our liberties and our freedoms and, and persecution uh, is, uh, you know, is coming for God's people. God knew that, that you were going to need more church, not less. Amen. God knew that, 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 that whoever saw that was going to need to be provoked unto love and good works with more church, not less. Look at verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy 
under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite under the spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So look at verse 26 one more time, because I want to, this isn't even in my notes, but I want to clear up some confusion here. It says in verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. See, some people, but let me read verse 27 also. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now a lot of people will look at this verse and say, okay, if you sin willfully after you've been saved, you have to repent. And if you die in an unrepented state, you will go to hell. Now we absolutely know that's not true. Amen. Jesus said, I give unto me eternal life and they shall never perish. Right. We believe very strongly very adamantly, once saved, always saved. Amen. The Bible teaches that over and over and over again. Okay, so this is not any way, shape, or form suggesting that we, if we sin willfully after we've been saved, that we're going to go to hell if we don't repent or anything like that. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is uh, Jesus was the final sacrifice. There is no more sacrifices. So one of the purposes of those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament was to help them get mercy. Never they were never for salvation. Never for salvation. They got mercy. Uh, grace came by faith. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, all in the Old Testament. They were saved in the Old Testament the same way we're saved in the New Testament. By grace, through faith. Those animal sacrifices didn't get them grace. That came through faith. It got them mercy. When they sinned, they committed a sin, they could go sacrifice an animal, and now God would deal with them more gently. They could dilute God's wrath. Dilute God's judgment. So they would go sacrifice an animal to get God to spank them less hard, less severe. That's what it got. It got a mercy. Didn't get him grace. It got a mercy. Well, we don't have that anymore. We don't have that anymore in the New Testament because Jesus was the, 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 the lamb without spot, without blemish. He was the sacrifice. So there remaineth no more sacrifices. So we can't get God to cut us slack the same way they could get God to cut them slack. Because we don't have sacrifices. And God demands more from us than He demanded them. Here's a misconception. Oh, we're under the age of grace. Oh, we can all live free. We can all do whatever we want to do. We are, we're under grace. We're not under law. We're free, bro. We're free in Christ, bro. Why are you such a legalist? Why are you trying to bring yourself up under the law? We're free in Christ, bro. They don't understand their Bible. Because the New Testament, grace always demands more than the law. In the Old Testament, uh, it was a sin, it was a crime to murder someone. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus raised the bar. He raised the standard. He said, if you have hatred in your heart, you're guilty of murder. That's right. In the Old Testament, it was a crime. It was a sin to commit adultery. Jesus raised the bar. He raised the standard. He said, if you even think about committing adultery, you've done it and you're guilty of it in your heart. So how are you going to tell me that grace doesn't demand more than the, old, than the law? We understand to whom much is given, much shall be required. Amen. We understand things better than they understand. And uh, God's been good to us. We don't have to do all that stuff that they did to find God's favor. So that's what that's saying. That's not saying that if you sin willfully, you have to repent or you're going to hell or anything like that. Uh, what it's saying is, is 
we don't have the same means to dilute God's judgment like they did. So in the New Testament, if we sin willfully, we can expect to get dealt with harshly by God. That's what this is teaching. Okay, let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would take my uh, humble thoughts, my feeble thoughts, my efforts, and you'd use them to help somebody this morning, be a blessing to someone this morning, encourage someone this morning, challenge someone this morning. Thank you for our visitors. Lord, I pray they'll find a warm welcome and they'll be able to say it was good to be in your house today. In Jesus' name, I pray for power. Amen. Amen. So the title of my sermon is, What Should We Look For? What should we look for? So, number one, we should look for judgment and fiery indignation. You know, the, the reason why I came up with this title is there is some things specifically that we're told to look for in the Bible. And there is some things that we're told to look for in the Bible that relate to prophecy. So I've had this on my mind because I'm thinking about this prophecy conference coming up. I'm preaching on Revelation. And I thought, well, I'm just going to look for some things in the Bible that the Bible, God specifically tells us we are to look for. I'm going to just look for that, the phrase that comes up in the Bible, looking for. And it says in verse 27, But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So I've got three things I'm going to talk to you about this morning that we are to look for. The Bible specifically tells us to look for. And the first thing we are to look for is judgment and fiery indignation. We saw in Hebrews 10 that we should expect judgment and fiery indign indignation <laughs> if we sin willfully. Yeah. You know what that's God's way of saying? A whooping. That's right. We should expect a whooping. Because God is not illegitimate. And if I let my children run buck wild and do whatever they wanted to do with no chastisement, no discipline, no punishment, you would call me an illegitimate dad. Well, our, fa our Heavenly Father's not that way. He's not illegitimate. He's going to deal with his youngins, amen? amen. He's going to deal with his youngins. He wants his youngins to act like they got some home training, amen? So he's going to deal with them. Number one, we can expect judgment, fiery in indignation if we <coughs> uh, uh, sin willfully. And look, don't forget, the context of this is forsaking church. Forsaking church. All right? And he shouldn't have to uh, punish us for forsaking church because we should be glad. Amen. We should be like David. I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We, we, we should be glad about church. We, we should be happy about church. It shouldn't be drudgery. Nobody should have to twist our arm to go to church. We should be glad about it. But if we sin willfully, we should look for what? A whooping. What does it mean that we should look for that? It says, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. What does that mean? That means we should expect it. If we're just going to go out and do what we want to do and try. Hey, look, once saved, always saved. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I like what Brother Beebe says. I couldn't do a swan dive in the lake of fire if I wanted to. Who's ever seen that movie, uh, Back to School, that old movie with, was it Dangerfield? Was Rodney Dangerfield? Is that who it was? He had that special dive called a triple lending. Everybody remember that? <laughs> and he'd get up and he'd check the wind and he would do all that stuff and he'd do this, this special dive he had. I couldn't do a triple lending in the lake of fire if I wanted to, praise God. Amen? I'm saved. And I don't worry about hell I, I'm, not, I'm not scared, oh, I'll go out and commit a sin and I'm going to hell. No, I don't worry about that. But I do worry about God wearing my hind parts out. I do worry about God taking me behind the woodshed. I do worry about hurting my Savior, grieving my Savior. The Bible says we can grieve Him. But when we do, when we do hurt Him, when we do sin, sin willfully, what should we, what should we, we should look for? Judgment, fire, indignation. And one of the reasons why I wanted you to, to look at that first, uh, the one of the reasons why I picked this verse first was because this verse, verse 27, helps us understand sometimes what it means in the Bible to look for something. We should expect it. 
Read verse 27 again. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation. What does that mean? If we sin willfully, we should expect God to deal with us. Amen? Amen. See how that word looking for is used there? Now that's going to help us understand something else we're supposed to look for. So I said the first thing we're supposed to look for is judgment and fiery indignation if we sin willfully. The second thing we're supposed to look for in the Bible is the blessed hope. <laughs> the blessed hope. Now go to Titus 2.13. Titus 2.13. And this is why it's important to compare spiritual with spiritual. What does it mean to look for something? Because there's a lot of false doctrine taught off of this verse. Let's look at Titus 2.13. Titus chapter 2, and all you got to do, you're in Hebrews, is just go to the left, just a few pages. And you'll be there in Titus. Go to the T-books. Titus is the last T-book. And uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Let's back up to verse 12. No, let's go to 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Amen. And that's why we don't believe in predestination. That's why we reject Calvinism. Because God's not going to say, here's my grace, here's my salvation, psych. You can't have it, you're predestined to hell. Right. What kind of God would do that? Right. I wouldn't walk across the street to serve that God. Amen. That's why we don't believe in Calvinism. That's why we don't believe in predestination to salvation. We believe God wants everybody to be saved. Amen. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, Amen. teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Uh-oh, there goes your dope. You can't smoke pot. Amen. There goes your booze. Righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So here's another thing we're supposed to look for. We're supposed to look for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And I love it that it calls Jesus the great God. The Father doesn't appear in the clouds at the rapture. This is talking about the rapture when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds to catch up His children out of this world before He destroys the earth with hellfire and brimstone mingled with blood. The Father doesn't come in the clouds. It's Jesus. So I love this verse here because it teaches that Jesus is God. Amen. So here's a verse you can share with Jehovah's Witness neighbors and, and, and uh, Mormon neighbors and, and those who don't believe that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Amen. He's the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Bible calls Him. And uh, so we're to be looking for that blessed hope. We're to be looking for when Jesus Christ returns in the clouds for us. To catch us up out of this earth. And we're talking about that revelation a lot. And uh, that is the theme. <coughs> that is the theme of the book of Revelation. The glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ coming in the clouds. The rapture. The rapture is the, is, is the, 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 uh, uh, the, the main theme there. Now, many use this verse to teach and support pre-trib. The pre-tribulation or rapture. You say, what in the world is pre-trib? I've heard, I heard you say that already this morning. What does pre-trib mean? Well, most Christians today believe that Jesus Christ is going to snatch His children out of this earth before they go through any real severe tribulation. Before they're faced with the decision to take the mark of the beast, to have a, uh, a more likely uh, computer chip inserted in your hand like they're doing in Sweden right now, your right hand and your forehead, more than likely it's going to track your vaccine status. That's how it's going to start. That's how, gonna, that's how they're going to dupe everybody and condition everybody to take the mark of the beast because now they're using it for, oh, it's just for vaccine statuses. And then one day your bank account is probably going to be attached to it, Bitcoin or whatever. So the Bible prophesied that thousands of years ago that that was going to happen. And we see it being rolled out, fulfilled before our very eyes. But many use this verse that we just read in Titus. Many use this verse to teach that the Lord's going to take us out, up out of here before a period of tribulation. 
And this really the greatest argument that they have, the pre-tribulational rapture crowd, and I've got plenty of friends that believe that. It's not a point of fellowship for me. I counted the other day. We've had 11 preachers preach from this pulpit that believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. So if you believe that, I'm not against you. Okay, uh, but I do want to preach the truth. I do want to preach what the Bible says. Uh, a lot of my friends believe that. It's not a point of fellowship with me. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. But I do want our church to believe right on this. Amen. Because I am trying to prepare you for coming tribulation that I believe we're going to see. Now the greatest argument that the pre-trib crowd has is imminency. They say Jesus can come at any moment. Because there are some verses that seem that they teach that Jesus can come any moment. And we just read one. We just read one there, Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. So they say, hey, we're supposed to be looking for Jesus. We're supposed to be expecting Jesus to come at any moment. That may, it sounds like a pretty good argument, right? They make a pretty good point. That's a pretty good point. But here's the thing. They don't understand what looking for means. If they would just take the time to cross-reference other places in the Bible where it says looking for, they would understand what looking for means, okay? It doesn't mean he can come any moment, all right? <clears throat> it means we are to be expecting him, expecting him. In many preachers use this verse, this, is, this verse is it's like a... a, a uh, a stumbling block for them to where they can't believe like we believe. They can't believe that we're actually going to be here to see tribulation because of this verse. I've got a good pastor friend of mine. He's preached at our church before. I'd like to have him back. I've preached at his church twice. I love his church. He's got a great spirit. Uh, man, I love his preaching. Uh, and he's kind of on the fence with this thing. He's kind of on the fence. There's a lot of preachers waking up right now because of things they've seen happen with the coronavirus. There's a lot of preachers waking up to the pre-tribulational rapture and saying, huh, I think this might be wrong. A lot of preachers waking up. And a lot of them on the fence right now. And this particular preacher that I'm talking about, he is, I believe he is on the fence because I was just at his church and he showed all these videos about the mark of the beast and everything and he never one time mentioned Jesus could come at any moment. We've talked about it a little bit. I believe he's on the fence. But uh, one of his hang-ups is this, and he said this to me. We've talked about it. We've talked about pre-trib rapture versus pre-wrath rapture, and this is what he told me. He says, well, your position, what you believe, has you looking for the Antichrist. My position has me looking for Christ. I'm supposed to be looking for Christ, not the Antichrist. You're looking for the Antichrist first. I'm looking for Jesus first. That's, his, that's one of his arguments he makes. Why he can't believe the way we believe as far as pre-wrath rapture goes. Well, that's a good argument, but the problem is looking for back then was used a little different than the way we use it today. We saw that looking for means expecting. We're supposed to be expecting our Savior to come. Looking forward to our Savior comes. It doesn't mean we're sitting out in the backyard twiddling our thumbs expecting Him to come any moment. Because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2 says that, or was it verse 3, I believe? I'll read it to you. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So it clearly says that day, the coming of Christ to catch us up out of here, cannot come except the Antichrist come first. I'm not looking for the Antichrist because I'm not looking forward to Him coming. I'm looking for Jesus to come because I'm expecting Jesus to come. I'm excited about Jesus coming. I'm anticipating Jesus coming. So I'm looking for Jesus because that's what I'm expecting. That's what I'm anticipating. That's what I'm excited about. Jesus doesn't want us to sit in the backyard and look in the eastern sky and just look for Him to come. That's not what that means. He wants us to be excited and look forward to His coming. Amen? <laughs> now today is actually the last day of deer season. Y'all know I'm a big deer hunter. I love deer hunting. Today is a sad day because it's actually the last day of deer season. But guess what? I'm already looking forward to next year. Yeah. 
I'm already looking for next year's hunting season. It doesn't mean I think it can come any moment. Right. <laughs> that doesn't mean because I'm looking for next year's deer season that I think it's going to come, could possibly come next week. Or the week after. Or the month after. No. I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. But I know it can't come any minute. Right. Yeah, it's good. It's good. I'll give you a few of Fred Bear's Ten Commandments of Hunting. Fred Bear was the modern forefather. Uh, or the, I'm sorry, he was the forefather father of modern bow hunting. A uh, guy I have a lot of respect for. And I'm going to give you just a few of his Ten Commandments of Hunting. Number one, don't step on anything you can step over. When you're stalking through the woods, you're not supposed to step on sticks because they'll crack and they'll catch a deer's attention. He'll look up and he'll see movement. All right, number two, don't look for a deer. Look for movement. And remember, that's what they're looking for. Deer are very camouflaged. You probably will not be able to see a deer uh, in the woods because they're so camouflaged. But what you can do is you can see movement. You can see their white tail flicker. You can see movement. So look for movement when you're trying to spot a deer. Number eight, be sure of your shot. Nothing is more expensive than regret. All right, it's, it's a bad feeling to, to womb a top, sorry, to wound an animal, maim an animal, and know that it's suffering. You want to get a good ethical shot, quick kill, all right, harvest the animal very quickly. Number 10, last one I'll give you. All right, uh, and this is the point. I'm, I'm trying to make a point here from number 10, the 10th commandment, Fred Bear's uh, 10 commandments of hunting. Next year's hunt begins the minute this season's hunt ends. Next year's hunt begins the minute this season's hunt ends. And I knew deer season was fixing to come to an end. I've already been making preps for next year. I got an app installed on my phone to where I can ride around and it shows property lines and property owners and I can approach people because I'm an urban bow hunter. I love hunting in urban areas because the deer are used to human sense and, and uh, they're not pressured and it's just, I enjoy urban hunting, a lot more action urban uh, hunting, bow hunting than other places. Uh, you don't have to spend all this expensive money on these leases. So I got this app on my phone where I can ride around and see property lines and owners and I can talk to people and uh, you know, to also try to give them the gospel, amen. But uh, you know, I, I've also been taught, I got a buddy in uh, uh, Kansas. I'm trying to go hunt with my buddy. He's been inviting me in Kansas. Kansas is the line, land of the monster bucks. And I've been talking to him uh, uh, about, he's been inviting me for years, a good friend of mine in Kansas to come hunting with him. I've been talking to him, making preps. What am I doing? What am I talking to you about? I'm talking to you about, I'm looking forward to next year's deer hunting. Deer, deer, deer season. I, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting it. I'm anticipating it. I'm looking forward to it. But I, I know it's not coming tomorrow, folks. I know it's not coming tomorrow. So there goes your argument for, uh, for, for pre-trib rapture. For, okay? for, for, for the argument of imminency. For the argument of, well, uh, we're supposed to be looking for it. That means it can happen every, any, any moment. Nope. The man of sin hasn't been revealed yet. We're expecting him. We're looking forward to him coming. But we know it can't happen any minute. If we look for him coming, if, that means that we'll, we'll expect he's coming. And we'll stay excited about him coming. We'll stay encouraged about him coming. And we'll not be too nailed down in this old world. That's why I believe God wants us to look. Expect, anticipate, look forward to His coming. So we're not going to get too tied down. So we'll stay excited. We'll stay encouraged. Because we know what happens in the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. I asked Brother First to teach about expectancy and imminency. I learned that phrase from him. He'd be here Thursday night. And I asked him to teach on uh, expectancy versus imminency. I think that's a great uh, contrast there. Expectancy versus imminency. Go to 2 Peter 3.10 if you would please. 2 Peter chapter 3. So uh, you're in Hebrews I believe or where were you? Titus. Go to the right. Just a few pages. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Verse 10 through 13. Or 10 through 12. 2 Peter 3, verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, 
into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Sing then that all these things shall be dissolved with the manner with I'm sorry, shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So this is how we ought to be. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So we'll be looking, we are to be looking for that. This is what manner of persons we ought to be. We ought to be looking for that. Hasting unto the coming. Looking forward to it. Amen. Excited about it. Uh, you know. Excited about it. Alright. So what are the things we should look for? Okay. Let me, let me back up and say a few things on this verse here. It says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So. A lot of people will use that to teach eminency as well. But the only one that Jesus is coming to a thief, as a thief for are the unsaved. Are the backslidden Christian who's not looking for His coming. Who's not expecting His coming. God gives us signs and different things that we can know the seasons and the signs of the times. And we can say, hey, it's getting close. So we're not caught off guard. He's not coming for the expectation. Expecting Christian. He's not coming for the Christian who's looking for his coming as a thief. That's just to the Christian who's caught off guard because he's uh, so consumed with the cares of the world. The backslidden Christian who's not in church, who's just ate up with the world. Or the unsafe person. Those are the ones that are going to be caught off guard with Jesus coming as a thief. Not the ones looking for his coming. And it says when he comes... Last part of that verse says, Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with the fervent heat. You say, when does that happen? Well, that happens in Revelation chapter 8, about 30 minutes after he snatches us up out of here. Uh, the Bible says he pours out uh, hell and fire mingled with blood, and a third of the trees and all the grass is burnt up. He's got to. If he did it at Sodom and Gomorrah, he's got to do it here. He promised that he wouldn't destroy the, the earth with a flood, but he didn't promise that he wouldn't destroy it with fire. And Sodom and Gomorrah, the perversion, and the sodomy, and the freaks, it's going to be just like that here. Okay? And he's going to do the same thing here that he did in Sodom. It's just going to be on a bigger scale. Because of the perversion and the abomination run amok. Okay? That's the purpose. That's why he's catching us up out of here. Because he doesn't want us to receive that. To uh, participate in that. But number one, what are the things we should look for? Whoopings for willful sinning. Number two, what are the things we should look for? The blessed hope. As we're going through our daily lives, what are we supposed to look for? Whoopings. The blessed hope. And number three, mercy. We're supposed to look for mercy. We're told to look for mercy. Jude 121. Go to Jude 121. Turn to the right. Jude is the book right before the book of Revelation. The last book before you get to Revelation. <coughs> it's only got one chapter in it. So it's real easy to find. Jude's right before Revelation. Look at Jude 121. This is the third and last thing I'm going to... Talk to you about this morning that we should be looking for. We should be looking for mercy. Jude one twenty one. Or it ain't, it ain't no one. It's just twenty one. Sorry, Jude twenty one. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, unto. Eternal life. So keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ on eternal life. So the third thing we should look for is mercy. And if we keep ourselves in the love of God, we can look for or expect to get mercy. That's good. So the other side of that coin is 
If we don't keep ourselves in the love of God, we should not expect much mercy. That doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. It just means we, we should expect a severe whooping if we don't keep ourselves in the love of God. You said, well, I thought nothing could separate us from the love of God. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Look, it's pretty clear. If we're saved, God will always love us. If you're saved, you're His child, and God will forever. Ever love you. It may not feel like it sometimes as he's applying the board of correction to the seat of knowledge when you're behind the woodshed. It might not feel like he loves you, but that's the reason why he's chastising you and punishing you and I because he does love us. Okay? Because he does love us. <laughs> he wants us to do right. It might not always feel like he loves you, but he promised he will, you will never be separated from his love. Amen. But it doesn't always mean we will be in his love or a beneficiary of his love. You realize I will always love my children no matter what. No matter what, there will always be a, a, a deep abiding love for my children. But it doesn't always mean they're going to be a beneficiary of that love. God's always going to love us. Nothing can separate us. Nothing. No creature, not even yourself, can separate you from the love of God. But it doesn't mean you're always going to be a beneficiary of that love. It doesn't always mean you can be a recipient of that love. I will always love my kids, but it doesn't mean I'll always show them I love them. How do they get that? How, how, did they, how did my kids uh, become a beneficiary or recipient of my love? Keeping my commandments. That's why. That's how. You know, oftentimes I say, hey, who wants to go with me? I, I got to go run this errand. I got to go run that errand. Anybody want to ride with me? And one of my kids wants to go ride with me and spend time with me. I, I oftentimes hook them up with something. They ask me, hey, Dad, can I get this drink or can I get this pack of gum or whatever? I hook them up with something just to show them I love them because they want to spend time with me. Yeah. You know, the father's the same way. Yeah. When you want to spend time with him, he's, he's liable to want to hook you up. Amen. He's liable to want to bless you. That's good. Yeah. And then when I tell my kids to do something and they do it, they obey me, that makes me want to hook them up. Yeah. That makes me want to show them my love. Amen. Now, when I'm disciplining my kids, and they admit they're wrong, and they're crying before I already got the paddle out because they're telling me they're sorry and they know they're wrong, I'm going to go a little bit easier on them. Instead of giving them three licks, I might give them one and a half or two. <laughs> Amen. But if they're bucking and bowing up on me and trying to pass the buck and trying to tell me that they didn't do it and they, they didn't do it and they were caught red-handed, I'm not going to cut them any slack, man. Right. They're getting all of it. Right. They're getting all of it. Amen. They're getting all of it. Same truths with God. If we want God to be in God's, uh, if we want to expect God's mercy, then what are we to do? What did you say we were to do? Keep yourselves in love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we want to expect mercy, then we've got to keep ourselves in the love of God. How do we do that? By keeping His commandments. Jesus said, if any man love me, keep not my commandments. It says that we're, we're, you're, you're a liar. All right, same is true with God. Go to Deuteronomy 7, 9, and we're almost done. Last verse we'll look at, and I'm almost done. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse, verse number 9. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 7, verse number 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, and this is the part I wanted you to see. I hear pages turn, I'll read it again. 
Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So there we see again, God, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, God's covenant and God's mercy was conditional upon loving him. And if you love him, you're going to keep his commandments. And if you keep his commandments, you can look for mercy. You can expect mercy. Amen? You can expect mercy. So number one, what should we look for? We should look for whoopings when we uh, uh, sin willfully. We should look for whoopings. Hey, and let's just be honest. We can thank God that he's, he's never given us probably what we deserved. God's merciful. God's patient. God's long-suffering. And if we got what we deserved, we'd all be in hell. And he's never probably given us as many whoopings as we really deserve. Because he's patient, he's merciful, he's long-suffering. He puts up with us and loves us when we're not even lovable. So we're thankful for his mercy. We're thankful for his grace. But we also should be thankful for his whoopings. Because he's just trying to help us do right. He's just trying to help us be blessed. Amen. So what should we look for? Number one, whoopings. Number two, we should look for the blessed hope. Not that it can come any moment. Not that Jesus can come any moment. But we should be looking forward to it when it does come. We should live like it could come any moment. Because you could meet the Lord at any moment. <laughs> you could take your last breath and meet the Lord at any moment. So we still should meet. We still should live like we could meet the Lord at any moment. Number three, we should look for mercy. If we'll do what? Love Him, keep His commandments. And when we do that, we can expect to get mercy. And we expect to get God to cut us a little slack. We all need that, don't we? We all need God to cut us a little slack. So three things we should be looking for this morning. I hope those were a help. I hope those were a blessing to you. Sister Amber, if you'll come at this time. Three things we should be looking for. <coughs> and as Sister Amber comes for our closing hymn, as Sister Amber comes and gets ready to play on the piano, I'm just going to open the altar up for a time of invitation. If you've got something that's heavy on your heart, you've got uh, a special request, special need, uh, we'll just have a time of invitation. But all